Good morning. Welcome you all into the Lord's house. I hope that you've had a wonderful Thanksgiving. A time to relax, a time to rest and be with your family, but most of all, a time to give thanks unto the Lord. I had a great Thanksgiving, got to be with my family, and then got to go duck hunting with the quaddle bombs. I actually killed some ducks after Michael left. So. Well, this morning I had intended to begin a Christmas sermon series. We were going to start it this Sunday, this morning service. And I just sought the Lord about it, and He kind of moved me in a different direction. I've got one more sermon to preach in the Gospel of Mark before we start a Christmas sermon series. Once we start this series, I probably, probably won't hear again from Mark until the first of the year. There's one more message before I start this upcoming series that God would have me share with you. I want to preach to you this morning just a very, very simple gospel message. And you may be thinking, you know, why, why do we have to keep coming back to the gospel? You know, you're not the first people to say that. We're not the first people to think that. The great reformer, Martin Luther... After the Protestant Reformation, he pastored a church in Wittenberg, Germany. And his people came to him and they said, Brother Martin, why do you insist on preaching sermons on the gospel? We know the gospel. Why do you keep doing this? And he said, two reasons. He said, first, there's some of you that don't know the gospel. There's some of you that are lost, so I'll keep preaching the gospel. But he said, secondly, all of us fail to live as if we believe the gospel. And until we live like we believe it, I'm going to keep preaching it. That's why, folks, it's so important from time to time that we as a church, we just need to stop and go back to the simple message, go back to the good news of Jesus Christ and salvation through Him. And that's what I want us to do this morning. Take your Bible and open it to the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark. This morning we're going to be looking at Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. We've already seen Jesus encounter um, the demon-possessed man of the Gadarenes. We have seen Jesus go to Jairus' house, the synagogue official, and heal his daughter. Now I want to deal with an event that takes place right dead in the center of Jesus making His way to Jairus' house. It's a very short passage of Scripture. It's a very familiar story to us. But don't let your over-familiarity cloud your judgment, cloud your thinking. This is a very important passage of Scripture because in it we have pictured for us salvation through Jesus. You know this passage as Jesus dealing with the woman who had the issue of blood. Look with me now. Mark chapter 5, beginning in verse 25. Jesus is surrounded by a crowd. He's making his way to the synagogue official's home. And as he does, he encounters a lady. Listen to what we're told from Brother Mark. Verse 25, a woman who had a hemorrhage for 12 years and had endured much at the hands of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was not helped at all, but rather had grown worse after hearing about Jesus... She came up in the crowd behind him and touched his cloak. For she thought, if I just touch his garments, I will get well. Immediately the flow of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Immediately Jesus, perceiving in himself that power proceeding from him had gone forth, he turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you and you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see the woman who had done this. But the woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, I love this part, daughter. Your faith has made you well or whole. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction." May God add His blessing to the public reading of His Word. Will you join me in prayer this morning? Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before You. And Father, first we want to come before You and give You praise because You are the one true and living God. There is none other besides You. And this morning we want to reaffirm our loyalty and our devotion to You. 
And Father, right now we collectively want to confess to you that we are sinners. We are sinners by nature and we are sinners by choice. There are things that we do that break your law and there are things that we fail to do that break your law. And Father, our sin is worthy of condemnation. But Lord God, we want to thank you this morning that there is forgiveness, there is cleansing, and there is hope. In Jesus, through the shedding of His blood. We thank You for that this morning. And Lord, we just pray that Jesus would wash us afresh in His blood and cleanse us. Father God, I pray this morning, as we think about salvation, Lord, I know that there's folks here who are lost. I know that there's folks here, if they look back over their lives, there's never been a time when they've turned it all over to Jesus. There's never been a time when they've given their lives to Him and surrender. I pray, Lord, for those, whoever they might be, man, woman, or child, I pray, Lord, today that Your Holy Spirit would convict them and woo them and bring them to the point of acknowledging Jesus, not just as the Savior, not just as a Savior, but that they could say today, Jesus is my Savior, my Lord. And Father, I pray today as I proclaim this message, Lord, Father, I'm inadequate to do it. I'm unqualified. But Lord, I know that you dwell within me and I know that you strengthen me to do the things that you have called me to do. Anoint me with your Holy Spirit. Give me the strength, Lord, with which to do this. And Father, I pray that the same Holy Spirit who anoints me, that he would move among us today, that he would make hearts and minds sensitive to the things of you so that your gospel would have a hearing today. Lord God, may you have free reign in this time of the service. And I ask this in Christ's name, amen. This week as I was praying about a message, I told you I originally sensed it, you know, I was going to start my Christmas sermon series and the Lord kept bringing me back to this passage. And I'm going to be honest and I'm going to testify right here. This is one of those passages that is so familiar that it's hard to preach a sermon on. Does that make sense? I had to pray about this and pray about it. Lord, what do you want me to say? What does this passage say? Only when I know what it says can I preach this message. And as I prayed about it, as I sought the Lord about it, it it hit me like a thunderbolt. This is about salvation. This woman had a disease. She had a hemorrhage of blood. No doctor could help her. No one could help her. Only Jesus could and He was willing to do so. Folks, that's us. We all have a disease. We all have an affliction called sin and no one can help us save Christ Jesus the Lord. Looking at this passage of Scripture, I want to talk to you about salvation this morning and I want to share with you three simple words about salvation. I don't have some kind of catchy, clever outline. I don't have a bunch of eloquent stories this morning. I've just got three words. Separation sufficiency, and solace. Say that with me. Separation, sufficiency, and solace. Think about separation with me now. I want you to look at verse 25 again in our passage. Mark introduces us to this woman and he describes, us to, uh, describes her to us. He said this was a woman who had a hemorrhage for 12 years. This word hemorrhage refers to internal bleeding and I don't want to go too far with that. I'll simply say that this was an affliction that is unique to a woman and it had been going on for 12 years. Can you imagine that? And it caused serious problems in her life. I want you to think about the problems that this affliction caused her on three levels. The first one is the most obvious. It caused her physical problems. If you're constantly bleeding, if you are constantly hemorrhaging, I read in medical journals, it will make you anemic. Any of you know much about anemia? I know we've got some nurses here. Uh, When you go through and have problems with anemia, there's certain symptoms. I want to list these symptoms to you and I want you to think about this lady. She suffered from some of these or all of them for 12 years. What are some symptoms of anemia? Well, one of them is fatigue. Another is weakness, dizziness, headaches, numbness or coldness in your hands and feet, low body temperature, pale skin, rapid or irregular heartbeat, shortness of breath, chest pain, irritability. This woman who had this issue of blood, she was anemic and she suffered from some or all of these for 12 years. Can you imagine what she was going through? 
She was no longer living. She was simply existing. Life was misery for her because of this physical condition, because of this physical ailment that she was going through. But she was not only simply suffering physically, she was suffering emotionally. Her condition made her ritually or ceremonially unclean. That meant that any person who came in contact with her, they would be rendered unclean. They would be rendered ritually or ceremonially unclean. That meant that her friends, her family, and her community shunned her. And she was isolated for 12 years. Can you imagine that? Think of this. For a period of 12 years, she had little or no human contact. Every time I read this encounter that Jesus had with this woman, I I think about a little widow lady at one of the churches that I served. Her name was Toby. And I can remember she used to tell me every time she'd come to church, she said, Brother Randy, my favorite part of coming to church is the hugs that I get. Her husband had been gone a long, long time. And she said, I miss human touch. I miss human contact. That's the way this woman was. No person would have anything to do with her for 12 years. She was separated. Separated from good health and well-being. Separated from her friends, her family, and her community. But there's one final separation, one final level of her affliction that makes the others pale in comparison. Her condition, I told you earlier, it left her ceremonially or ritually unclean. That meant that she could not go to the temple to worship God. That meant that she could not go to the synagogue to study the scriptures. That meant that she could not approach God in worship in any form or fashion. Can you imagine that? Not being able to come to the Lord. Not being able to praise His name. Not being able to study His Word. Folks, you and I, we have a condition that's very similar. We may not be hemorrhaging blood, but we have a curse. We have a condition that separates us from the Lord, just like her condition did. The condition is called sin. Sin is breaking God's law. Sin is doing those things that displeases the Lord. And we have a sinful nature inherited from Adam and from Eve, and we commit sins, sins of omission and sins of commission, things that we do, things that we fail to do. And this curse separates us from Almighty God, and it's because He's holy. He's not just any old God. He is the holy God. Isaiah, the prophet of God, said in Isaiah 59 verse 2, speaking about the Lord and speaking to sinful men and women, he said, Your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden His face from you so that He does not hear. That's what happens to sinners. You approach God in prayer? Absolutely not. He will not give you a hearing. You try to approach Him in worship? You try to approach Him in fellowship? Absolutely not. There is a barrier. There is a partition. There is a separation that sin causes, and He will not have fellowship. He will not have a relationship with you. And I know you've all heard that before, but I want you to think about it like this. I think we take that aspect for granted. We take God's holiness for granted. We take our sinfulness for granted and we fail to realize how bad it really is. Picture this scenario, okay? You and your family, it's nighttime, you're all in the bed getting ready to go to sleep and you hear a knock at the door. You put your house shoes on, you put your robe on, you turn your porch light on, you open the door a little bit and you see a person, you see a man there. The man is covered with filth. Dirty. You can see it. You can smell it. He talks to you and he says, I won't in your house. And he uses vile language, cursing. He says, I won't in your house. And when you let me in your house, I'm going to kill you and I'm going to kill your family and I'm going to take everything you've got in your house. Would you let that person in? I'd be shutting that door, getting the deadbolt and, and going and getting my pistol in a hurry. But that's what it's like when we try to approach God. In our sin, is there any difference? We are vile, filthy because of our sin, and we are intent on doing evil. And yet some people think that they can approach the holy God 
in that condition. No, you can't. Sin causes a separation, and that is the starting point when we talk about the gospel. There can be no good news if there's no bad news. If it were not for sin, we would not need a Savior named Jesus. That's the first word that I want to share with you. Separation. This woman was separated from her health, separated from her community, and separated from her God by her condition. Our condition separates us from God. Sin puts up a barrier. Sin builds a wall between us and the holy God. Now I want to share with you a second word, and that second word is sufficiency. Sufficiency. Look at verse 26 of our passage. Mark introduces us to this lady in verse 25. And in verse 26, he kind of gives us a medical history, a case study of this lady. And he says in verse 26, she had endured much at the hands of many physicians and she was not helped at all. Um, that, let me read this again. <laughs> she had endured much at the hands of many physicians and she had spent all that she had and was not helped at all, but rather had grown worse. Mark says here, she'd gone to the doctors. She'd gone to the specialists. She'd gone to every doctor she could think of, seeking help, seeking a cure, seeking some kind of prescription, something that she could do to take away that hemorrhaging, to stop that bleeding. And he says there, she went to all these physicians. She spent all the money that she had, and she wasn't helped at all, but rather she had grown worse. You know, Mark is not the only one to include this encounter that Jesus had with this woman. Luke also includes it. But I, I like this little thing that he does. Luke leaves out a detail. In Luke chapter 8, verse 43, he introduces us to this woman and he, he says essentially the same thing that Mark does, but he leaves out a detail. He says this was a woman who had a hemorrhage for 12 years and she could not be healed by anyone. Do you see the little subtle difference there? Mark says she went to all these physicians, all these doctors, spent every last dime she had, wasn't helped at all. Luke says she couldn't be healed by anyone. He's being a little bit more diplomatic. You know why? He was a doctor. He's being going easy on his profession. The fact of the matter is she went to all these doctors, sought all these cures, and absolutely none of them worked. The doctors were wholly inadequate for treating her. And I tell you, when you think about the common treatments that they would issue for a disease like that, for an ailment like that back in that day, it's really not surprising. I want to share with you two common treatments for this illness back in Jesus' day. All right, if you had this problem, here's what the doctor would tell you to do. Here's what he would prescribe. The first one, the doctor would say, you need to carry the ashes of an ostrich egg in a linen rag around one's neck in summer and in a cotton rag in winter. That sounds like a winter, doesn't it? That sounds like it'll work, right? A second treatment that they would prescribe, carrying barley, barley corn from the dung of a white female donkey. Does that sound like it would work? No. These doctors were wholly inadequate to treat her, wholly inadequate to help her. She spent everything she had with these consultations, everything she had with these I just touch his garments, I will get well. Immediately, the flow of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Where the doctors failed, Jesus succeeded. Where the doctors were inadequate, Jesus was totally sufficient to bring about healing in her life. When she went to him in faith, her faith was met by the overwhelming, mighty power of Jesus Christ. It didn't take a few days for the hemorrhaging to stop. Jesus did not have to issue a couple of rounds of antibiotics. He didn't give her a steroid. What happened? The power simply flowed from him and boom, it stopped. Boom. He, she was healed. We have an affliction too, don't we? Sin. It's a curse that all of us bear. Every person ever born 
has fallen short of the glory of God. We have a sinful nature. We have that curse called sin. You can't fix it yourselves. Our righteousness is as filthy rags according to God's Word. You can't clean yourself up enough to be right in the eyes of God. Trying to make yourself clean enough, trying to get rid of your sin, it's like trying to empty the Atlantic Ocean with a thimble. You can't do it. It's not going to succeed. It's inadequate. But Jesus is adequate for our salvation. Jesus is adequate to bring about healing, to bring about cleansing for our sin. He is sufficient. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. He talks about the blessings that we have received from the Father through His Son Jesus. And listen to what he says. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. The Lord has given us everything we need concerning salvation. Who is He giving it through? Jesus. Jesus is sufficient for the cleansing of sins. I would ask you this morning, are you trying to deal with your sin? To whom and to what have you gone to to seek treatment for your sin? You cannot fix it yourself. Some other religion, some other guru, they can't take care of your sin. There is only one who can, and that is the Son of God. That is Jesus Christ. He is totally, totally sufficient. I was thinking about that word sufficiency this week, and I just want to illustrate Christ's sufficiency to you. Have you ever gone somewhere and you get out your old debit card and you're going to make a purchase and you scan that card and you wait for one or two words to pop up? You know what I'm talking about? Approved or declined? You ever had that happen before? When Trisha and I first got married, uh, we were going to take my parents out to eat. You know, we were going to pay for it. Amen. So we told them, you get an appetizer, you get a main course, get a dessert, get everything you want. We'll take care of it. We're going to treat you. Well, we did all that. We had a pretty big bill. Put my debit card down, said, we'll take care of it, Daddy. Your money's no good here. Waitress brought her card back. I was expecting to sign. She said, sir, this has been declined. (laughs) <laughs> Sweat started to break out. Son, son, I'll, I'll take care of it. No, Daddy, I'm, I'll take care of it. I'll take care of it. Couldn't get the card to work, so Daddy had to take care of it. Insufficient funds. Folks, I'll tell you this. If you're depending on yourself, if you're depending on anyone else but Jesus, there's going to come a time when you're going to stand before God and there's going to be a sin debt. There's going to be a sin bill when you stand before Him. And you know what the Lord's going to say? You're insufficient. You can't deal with this sin. On your own. But I'll tell you this if you come to Jesus, He has unlimited credit with His Father. He has plenty. He is sufficient to take care of it. Have you come to Jesus to deal with your sin? Have you come to Jesus to find forgiveness, to find cleansing from your sin? I've shared two out of three words with you so far. I've shared with you separation. I have shared with you sufficiency. Now I want to share with you one more word solace. Solace means to bring relief. Solace means to alleviate one who is in pain. When this lady came and touched Jesus, the idea that's in the text in verses 27 to 29 is that she was in the middle of a crowd and she sneaks up covertly from the midst of that crowd and touches the hem of his garment. What she probably touched was a knot on his prayer shawl. Each Jewish man had a prayer shawl. They would cover their heads at times of prayer and times of worship, and they always kept it on their shoulders at all times. The idea is that she crept up and she simply touched that knot. Why did she do that covertly? Well, you see, she was doing a cultural no-no. She was doing something that was taboo for her society. You see, you were not supposed to touch a rabbi. A woman was not supposed to touch a rabbi. Only the rabbi's wife could touch him. But what's more important is she was ceremonially unclean. What would she be doing to Jesus if she walked up and touched him? In the culture's mind, making him unclean. So she goes up and she touches him. And Jesus sensed that power has gone from him, that power has moved and brought about healing. So he turns, he says, who touched me? How do you think that woman felt at that time? Scared to death. She had a mixture of emotions. In one aspect, she's in awe of Jesus. What these doctors could not do for 12 years, this man has done when I simply touched the knot of his prayer shawl. Who is this? 
and what power. But then she's also fearful, also afraid. But listen to what Jesus did. Look at verses 30 to 34. Look how he responded to her. I want you to notice what he did and what he did not do. Look at verse 30. Immediately Jesus perceiving in himself that power proceeded from him had gone forth. He turned around in the crowd and he said, who touched my garments? And the disciples kind of ridiculed him and his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you and you say who touched me? And he looked around to see the woman who had done this. Then the woman comes clean. It says, But the woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Notice what Jesus did and did not do. When she came to him needing healing, when she came to him broken, incomplete, needing to be made whole, He didn't get mad at her, did he? He didn't turn around and say, How dare you woman come to me? No. He didn't turn to her and say, Look now, I've got things to take care of. I'm going to Jairus' house. How dare you interrupt me? You're an annoyance. He didn't do any of those things, did he? What did he do? He turned around. He affirmed her. He gave her his time. And he blessed her. He said, You're whole. Daughter, I love you. Your faith has made you whole. You go in peace. You're healed. You know what this tells us about the Lord? He is the only one that can heal us. But when we come to Him seeking healing, He's not going to turn us away. When we come to Him seeking salvation, He's not going to get mad at us for asking. He will give it and He will give it freely and He wants to do it. He won't get mad. Where are you this morning? Where do you stand before the Lord? Are you caught Are you entangled in your sin? Have you been trying any and everything? Have you gone to the false doctors of the world seeking healing? Only the great physician Jesus can do it. And I promise you this this morning. If you will come to Him, He is sufficient to cleanse you of your sins. If you will come to Him, He will give you solace. He won't turn you away. He won't get angry. Jesus Himself said in John chapter 6 verse 37, The one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. He's not going to cast you out. He's not going to get mad at you. He wants you to come. He wants to bring healing to your life. He wants you to come broken, incomplete, so that He can make you whole and save you. Do you need Jesus this morning? I can't make it any simpler than that. Your sin has separated you from your God. He can't hear you. There's a barrier up. You can't have fellowship with Him. You can't have a relationship with Him. Your sin makes you vile. Your sin builds a wall. And only Jesus is sufficient to break down the wall. What did He do on the cross? He broke down, as Paul said in Colossians, that wall of partition. It's broken down. And now you can have free and easy access to the Holy God. But it's only through His Son, Jesus. If you will come today, He'll give you solace. He'll give you relief. He will alleviate the pain that sin has caused. He won't turn you away. He'll say, come child. He will embrace you. He will save you. Are you in need of salvation today? Right now we're going to have a time of invitation and I want to invite you to come and to receive Jesus. If you are without Christ, you are lost and you're on your way to hell. There will come a time when you stand before God and you know what He'll say? You're insufficient to deal with your sins. We all are. But Jesus is adequate. Jesus is sufficient. Will you come to Him And will you receive salvation? Brother Terry, Ms. Debbie is going to come. And I want to invite...